so. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that agenda one more time. So the purpose of today's uh, event, today's webinar, is to talk about the payments industry itself, who the players are, who the base players are, some of the old types that are being a little more abandoned, and some of the new players coming in. Really encourage questions. We have a lovely group today, and some of you have been in payments for quite some time. So it probably makes sense that uh, you will want to ask questions when we get on certain slides. Please just put those in the chat. I will answer them. And if I don't see them, Andrea will make sure that I do. She'll pop back in as she just did and make sure that I see your questions. Do want to make this as interactive as possible. So we're just going to talk real briefly about the growth in the payments industry and where we're seeing it. We're seeing it more in digital commerce than anywhere else. And I think this is very intuitive for most of us. We know that as the world changes and as we do less and less in a face-to-face -face mode, it makes sense that we should see the digital commerce on the upswing. You'll also notice that Asia Pacific has a larger growth pattern than any other region in, in the world. And that's because you have some lesser developed areas more in the South, Southeast Asia markets, and those tend to grow faster. Those tend to really move up and to the right because they have so much room to grow. And of course, Europe and the US and Canada continue to grow at a healthy pace because we have so much innovation that always occurs as well to keep us moving. And where, where do we see most of that growth? We see it in the role of SaaS companies, um, the software as a service ISVs that then add payments in, they embed payments in. That's where we see a lot of that growth. And of course, we see it in the traditional world or the larger fintech players. They're not going anywhere and uh, they the big tech really does help. So you've got the Shopify's of the world, the squares of the world. So you're, you're going to see a lot of growth there, but you'll also see it in the individuals, the entrepreneurs uh, out there that will come up with new ideas and create that company and then embed payments into it. So that's where you're gonna see some of that growth. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about who are the players? Who are the base players in the industry? You've got the card networks, that makes sense. We all know Visa and MasterCard, Discover and American Express also play a big role. Issuing banks, acquiring banks, payment processors, and where we're gonna spend a lot of our time today will be on the merchant acquirers and on embedded payment providers. So the ISOs, the marketplaces, the payment facilitators, that's really where we're going to spend a lot of time. We're gonna start by learning a little bit about the card networks. They provide the infrastructure for our payments industry. We know them again, as I said, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover. They provide the rails that the payments ride on. They also are setting the rates that the, the interchange rates that the banks, the acquiring banks are paying to the issuing banks which is different from the discount rate, but the, the interchange rate. They also establish the rules and regulations and they perform that regulation. They perform that oversight of the banks. It is then the banks that perform the oversight of other players and we'll see that as we move on. One other function that you don't think about as much, but that is very important is the marketing function that the card brands play. They provide out to the industry confidence in the payment system and confidence in using that card. And they do that through their marketing engine, promoting their brand and promoting <clears throat> the rules around it and why you should feel safe when you use your card. And speaking of that card, you get that card from issuing banks. Issuing banks contract with the cardholder. We all have them. So everyone on this call is a cardholder. 
They also settle into the networks. So when a charge is made, they will pull the money from the credit or they'll they'll ding the or not ding, they'll uh, apply that charge to the credit line of the cardholder and they'll push that money to the acquiring bank. Prior to doing that, though, they're going to hold on to that interchange. That's where they make a big chunk of their income is that interchange. So even when you pay off your balance every month on that card and you think that the card holder or the card issuing company isn't making any money, they are. They're making interchange. And uh, that is quite a lovely amount of money for them. So they do well. Visa has what's called a bank identification number, and MasterCard has the Interbank Card Association number. You've heard these as BIN and ICA, right? So you will recognize that as the first four to six digits on your card. Just have some representative banks here that issue. There are many, many more. Acquiring banks. Now we're popping over to our side of the world. Acquiring banks are the financial institutions who contract with the card brands to be able to sponsor merchants, ISOs, payment facilitators into the payments ecosystem. These are some of the ones that we're used to seeing, Fifth Third Bank, Chase, Pathword, they used to be Meta, Pathword, B of A, Merrick. There are others as well, but there are not as many card acquiring banks as there are card issuing banks. Now, both the acquiring and issuing banks are responsible to the card networks and must follow the rules that the card networks put forth. They also are responsible for ensuring those that they sponsor into the payments world follow those rules. So they have to make sure that the um, that surcharges are done properly. I think some of you know Visa has been out there uh, on a rampage making sure that that is taken care of properly and that surcharging isn't uh, isn't occurring too much uh, or isn't occurring outside of the rules. And uh, you know, I just saw something on my screen. Are you guys still able to see the presentation? Andrea, I'm going to ask if it's still showing. Thank you. The odd thing on my computer, but I'm glad it's still working. Thank you, Andrea. So we're going to go on to payment processors. Uh, Adyen, WorldPay, Fiserv, TSYS. These are just some examples of processors. Processors are the ones that the gateway, or maybe they have a gateway themselves, connect to in order to get the authorization for the transaction. They then will settle both the, the information up to the card networks, as well as settle the funds back out. So those funds will go from the issuers to the networks. The networks will send it to the acquiring banks, but this is all done based on files and information that you will get and receive from the payment processors. So they have agreements both with the acquiring banks, the issuing banks, as well as ISOs and payment facilitators. So they sit in the middle and they do all of that processing. They can also do tokenization. They can also help with merchant, uh, with transaction monitoring. They can help with underwriting. They can do many of the different pieces in there. But the, they are a required piece. Um, you either have a payment processor or you are a payment processor, but you must have that processor in order for the, the system to keep rolling through. Now I want to talk about merchant acquirers, which isn't really a defined term, but you hear it out there a lot, and embedded payment providers. So these are the players that sit more in the middle and really help the payments ecosystem grow. They make sure that interchanges build. They make sure that we are connecting merchants to the payments ecosystem. So you have somebody like Till or Five Stars or Workwave, they are all payment facilitators. And I will show you in a slide coming up exactly where they sit in the ecosystem. but. What they really do is help 
the merchants get into the system and sometimes they're providing other services. I'll call out WorkWave who provides field services. And what that means is they have, or they provide a software for field services providers. So, so your HVAC person, your the person that might clean your pool, your gardener, they have software that will assist with their scheduling and other necessary items wrapped around those field services. And now what they've done is embedded payments into their software. And by embedding those payments into the software, what they are able to do is provide that service so that their client using their software doesn't have to go out and get their own merchant account. And as some of you might know, it can be riskier to be in the uh, field services space because the HVAC, the contractor that comes and does things, that's a riskier industry. There tend to be a few more chargebacks there than one would expect. And what this will assist with is WorkWave can see that those are real charges and they really had an appointment set because they're seeing that software. So they have better insight and better ability to perform risk monitoring than anybody else is going to have. So you get an extra layer of care or an extra layer of insight by having an embedded payment provider such as the PF in WorkWave. Now we've got KeyBank listed here because they are a merchant acquirer. But we're really going to we're really going to concentrate on the embedded service providers. But first, what I want to do is take a step back and talk about the old payment model that we're seeing people leave behind or not use as much in favor of the embedded payments model or that payment facilitator model. So the old models that we talk about are the referral models, the merchant of record, which I am here to say is not a defined term. While people use it, it is really not a defined term. And a merchant of record typically ends up being a marketplace or a, a payment facilitator. When you're calling yourself a merchant of record, oftentimes it just means you're not properly registered when you do things and you could have problems somewhere else. <clears throat> We're not seeing as many new ISOs pop up. We're seeing people become payment facilitators instead of ISOs. Now, I did mention something called a retail ISO and or a referral ISO, sorry. That would be what I would call a retail ISO. And we also had something called a wholesale ISO. These are terms coined by First Data many years ago. First Data is now Fiserv. But many of us in the industry have taken on these terms. The retail ISO is more of an ISO that is a sales arm. They're a marketing arm. They don't have integrations. They don't provide back office functions. They don't really do anything for the bank or for the processor, but they have a marketing arm that has... Uh, Typically, they have a road or a path into a certain vertical. They bring in those, they, what I say, throw them over the wall to whomever. It could be a wholesale ISO. It could be a processor. And then that, that will say they're working with the wholesale ISO. That's where the risk gets held. They have much more autonomy there. They can do the underwriting. They typically use the processor files to do the back office work. Uh, but they take on operational uh, support. They take on customer support. So they do a lot more when you're a wholesale ISO. One of the things they can't do is settle funds. They can't get in that flow. And if their processor or bank has a problem or doesn't understand what's happening with one of their merchants, that processor or bank may put funds on hold that the ISO didn't want to put on hold. And this is one of the reasons that the payment facilitator model starts to come up because you get more control in that area and you see things differently, as I mentioned a moment ago. So as stated, the referral model is low effort and you get a lower return. With the wholesale model, you'll get a slightly higher return. With the payments facilitator model, that's really where you get the largest return and the most control. 
So you are able to, uh, if you, you're able to control the movement of funds, you are able to see it within your own software, what's really being scheduled, what's really happening. So you understand that risk as a payment facilitator better than anybody. So this model, again, um, is a little lower and not being used as much. So what I wanna do now is just give you a brief example of the traditional payments ecosystem. For those of you in the audience that uh, have been in payments, you'll see that I've taken some liberties to make this very easy to understand, but the cardholder goes to the merchant. The merchant has gotten an account with either their acquiring bank or their processor. So they process the transaction through there. It goes up to the card brands the authorization comes back. And once everything settles, then the funds go from the uh, card issuer to the card acquirer, and then out to the merchant. Lots of nuances in there. This is not a seminar or, or webinar, sorry, about uh, how the funds flow. This would be much more detailed if that was what was happening. But this is the traditional flow. So that acquiring bank or processor kind of be where the ISO is. Now I want to talk about the embedded flow. You still have the merchant, but you have this embedded payment provider. And I'm going to use WorkWave as the example because we did see them on another slide. WorkWave being that field services provider. So they're providing many, many things to the merchants that can't be provided in the traditional sense. So what happens is when that merchant is going to that embedded provider for other types of things, what now has to happen is that embedded provider needs to do some work. So they need to do the merchant underwriting. They need to do the onboarding. Then when the transaction flows, before they let those funds flow, that embedded provider also needs to do that risk and compliance monitoring. They're now the ones responsible. They're also gonna need to make sure they can have fee management and funding operations being performed. So when that transaction strength goes through, it's going to go through that embedded provider, whether it happens at the auth level or whether it happens at the settlement level, depends on where that provider sits in the string. But what this shows is we've added that player right in the middle because they're adding so much value to that merchant. And again, what the embedded prov provider either has to purchase, they can come to somebody like Infinicept and uh, contract with us, or they have to build it internally. But they have to be able to underwrite, KYC, KYB of that merchant. They have to be able to onboard them up to the processor. Then they have to be able to pull that file in, do the risk and compliance monitoring, hold anything they need to hold, then apply fees as they need to apply them, create NACHA files, send those up, make sure the funds settle appropriately to the merchant. And once again, Infinicept has the ability to do this. So any embedded payments provider, whether they're a PF or a marketplace, could come to us and we would be able to help you with that. So uh, I've mentioned a couple of times embedded payments models, and I've said marketplaces, and I've said payment facilitator, but we also have payment as a service, payment facilitator as a service, or this hybrid model in there. So what I'm going to do now is explain these three different models. The first one we're going to talk about is a marketplace. A marketplace would be something like Etsy uh, or Uber, where you know you are doing business with Etsy or Uber, but you know Etsy or Uber is not providing the service. It's that underlying uh, retailer or person that's providing the service. But you know, if you have a problem, you don't try to find, if in the example of Uber, you don't try to find that Uber driver. You're going to go back to Uber itself. Hey, I left my cell phone in the car. Hey, I left my sweater. Um, hey, I had a problem. You go to Uber. 
So that's one of the pieces of a marketplace being different from a PF is you know you're doing business with the marketplace and you know that if you have any problems, you're going to go back to that marketplace. Now, they also have to do risk monitoring. They also have to settle funds. Now, I will tell you one of the big differences between a marketplace and a PF or another big difference is that funds must settle to the marketplace where in a PF, it doesn't have to be that. It just, the funds may settle to the market, to the PF, right? So you could choose to settle other ways and have it go directly to the submerchant or to the PF in an FBO model or to the PF and then back out to the, uh, to the submerchant. However, with the marketplace, it must go to the marketplace. So the one model that we haven't spoken a lot about is the PF light model, sort of that managed payment facilitator, some people might call it hybrid provider, other people might call it. The managed payment facilitator model overall is where you have a payment facilitator on the top layer, and the ISV kind of tucks up under that payment facilitator, and they're not taking any risk, sort of like a referral model, except to the merchant, they look like a payment facilitator because the real PF may not be as visible to that sub-merchant. They will see that, that managed PF or the PF light. PF as the, the PF as a service, it will not be seen as much. So they don't have ownership. They do have visibility. They do customer service. They do make sure that the gateway or however um, the transaction is going to move, terminal or gateway, they do have the control there too. So they have lots of control, but they can't hold funds. They can't dispute the holding of funds and they don't do the underwriting. So remember when we talked about that referral ISO and the wholesale ISO, the um, the retail and wholesale, kind of the same. PF light is the retail. The PF as a service provider is more like the wholesale. And the PF light is that huge marketing arm. The one that provides these service is the payment facilitator. They do provide all of the things that we spoke about in the slide with the magnifying glass. So the PF as a service or just the PF itself provides the underwriting, provides the oversight, provides the risk monitoring, provides the boarding, provides the settlement information. So it provides all of that stuff and then that ISV, if they're using this PF light and having them underneath, the ISV will then just be their referral model. And then you have the full payment facilitator, and that's where the payment facilitator is not bringing in payment uh, ISVs underneath them. They are simply a payment facilitator. They either are building all the pieces we spoke about in that magnifying glass slide, or they're contracting with somebody like Infinicept to do all of those things for them. How do you choose the right model for yourself? Well, this is not the easiest thing to figure out. And that's where companies like Infinicept come in. We can consult with you and help you understand whether you want to be a full payment facilitator, whether you want to be a payfac as a service and manage other ISVs underneath you, or whether you don't want to do any of that, you just want to be a PF light. So you really need, and there are many companies out there that can help you with pieces like this to really understand the difference between the PF light, payfac as a service, full payment facilitator, and help you understand all of the things that you have to do. And we'll kind of go all the way back to this slide because this really makes it simply clear all of the pieces that a payment facilitator must be able to do, whether they build it or whether they buy it. 
So that was a very high level in, in a half an hour, which was my goal. So we hit the goal. A very high level of the payments ecosystem where we talked about the players, we talked about the flow, we talked about the new embedded payments model with payment facilitators. There's so many places we can go deep on each slide that I thought I'd reach out at this moment to see if anybody wanted to throw a question in the chat. This is always fun when you look at the recording as we're waiting for questions to come up in the chat, if they're going to come up, because then it's this weird, awkward silence. I figured while we wait for the silence to fill, hopefully, um, I think it's worth noting that, you know, as Dina mentioned, there's so many areas in which we can go in much more detail on. Um, and FinnetsUp does have other resources, whether it's white papers, additional webinars, or even if you just want to reach out to us and ask questions. Um, our website is a great resource for all of those things if you do want to learn more. So just a little plug there um, while we give people time to ask questions. But I'm not seeing any. Oh, there we go. Here I'll we go. That one, Dina. <laughs> um, how do each of these parties make money? Great question. So I alluded to what's called a merchant discount. The merchant discount is what the merchant pays a percentage of the transaction. From that percentage of the transaction, interchange, it's percentage in pennies, interchange is pulled out. And that is what gets paid to the issuer. Then there's a very small sliver left. From that small sliver, the acquiring bank will get money, the processor will get money, and the payment facilitator will get money. So you begin to make pennies on all of those transactions, which is why volume is so important in merchant processing. There are other places to make money also. There will be terminal rental or lease or purchase fees. There will be fees for uh, monthly maintenance. Sometimes a monthly fee will be charged. If you're not PCI compliant, oftentimes a PCI compliant fee or non-compliance fee is charged. And those are ways that the payment facilitator makes money outside of that interchange flow. Uh, there can also be, when you think about, let's go back to the um, payment facilitator model, there's one called Run Sign Up, and I love the way they make money. They don't charge for their software, they give you their software for free and they will build a website for you and you can sign up. So they build uh, registration websites for sporting events, run, sign up. So if you're going to run this race, they build the website, you, the runners can come sign up. The runners can look afterwards on that website for their time. They can buy merchandise. They can do all of those things but rather than charging a fee for that, other than the merchandise that's separate, run sign up just charges a large discount rate. So they'll charge something around 6%, take out that interchange, pay those other pieces and they, those other players, and they have a much larger percentage left of that transaction because they're not charging for their software. They're bundling it in to the discount rate. So I hope that helped. I have just one more thing to add. I'm adding um, a link in uh, as an answer to that question. We ran a webinar back in October that talks about merchant pricing, um, but we also kind of go through the components of a transaction fee where all of the little pe different pieces go. And it kind of talks about how um, an ISV um, kind of makes money in all of this. So <laughs> um, that would be a great, I think, resource to go look back on. Thank you. I do remember that webinar. I'm glad you remember that, Andrea. I do um, suggest you guys do that. I think it will be good. Okay. And I don't know if anyone heard the dog bark in the background, but I'm in the office today and I am lucky enough to have a guest today. And the dog is outside of my office and uh, apparently is calling for me. So, Is it sweet little Oso? Yes. <laughs> She's infamous around, around infamous 
Okay, any other questions? I want to thank everybody for taking time today. I know it's tough uh, in our busy lives where we are on Zoom all day long to come to a webinar. Please do know that you can ask me a question at any point in time. If you have a question you didn't want to ask here, but you would like to contact me later, please link with me on LinkedIn. Ask me the question there. Or if you have my email, send it to me. I'm always happy to help. Again, thank you to Andrea for putting this together and thank you to all of you who took time out of your day to attend. Take care. Bye everyone.